There's a river flowing from the throne of God. Drink from the water right now. Oh, there's a river flowing from the throne of God. Drink from the water right now. It's a river of healing. I want you to know I have a relationship with my God like I have a relationship with my wife. And I am going to talk to him about it. And there's, a, there's an idea out there saying you can't talk to God about these things. What? what? What kind of relationship is that? If I want to talk to him, I will, and I'm not missing it if I do. Right. Are you listening? If I want to. Yeah. Amen? I got my arms folded. That's body language. I'm being defensive. No, <laughs> I'm just being comfortable. I'll get comfortable. Like this. But that's a fact. Amen. But Jesus, you know, Francis, God bless her. I miss it with her. You know, I've missed it once since I've been married to her. But pray for her. She really needs help. You know, she's not here to defend herself today, and I can get away with it, right? But you know what? Just because I missed it, just because I missed it with Francis, doesn't mean suddenly that we're divorced. You know, no, no, you know, I, I confess. Why is it the guys are always the apologizing ones? I don't know. <laughs> like, isn't it? We're always wrong, right? We're, we're wrong a lot, aren't we, Brother Bob? We're wrong a lot, aren't we, guys? Come on, boys, right? Isn't that right, ladies? Yes. You hear all the ladies? Yes. We just need that help, don't we? That's it. All right. Praise God. All right, so let me share something with you here. Couple, let's go on back now to the statement I made in this introduction of, of, of grace, this expanded definition. Before you ever existed, before you ever even existed, God knew you. He knew you. He knew everything that you were going to do, every thought that you would ever think. He knows it all. He's God. And yet, in spite of that, he provided for every single need that you might have in your whole life. He went ahead and did it. Isn't this wonderful? That before, in fact, let's, we need to read our text. We never, did you ever read 1 uh, Timothy or 2 Timothy? No, we didn't, did we? Let's read. Come on, man. Let's go. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a what? Spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God doesn't want you worried about anything. He doesn't want you fearful about anything. He wants your mind sound and peaceful. Is that right? Amen and love. So, verse 8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings, for the gospel according to the power of God. Now look at this. It says, who has what? Saved us and, come on, called us with a holy calling. Let's read it together. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Woo! Come on now. That is a woo moment. Woo! Say woo! Woo! Do it again. Woo! He did all that before time began. Not according to our works, but according to His grace. He did all of this before time began. You know, I think about the prophet Jeremiah. And God said this to him. He says, before, listen to this, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I believe that, of course, applies to everybody. Before you were in your mother's womb, God says, I knew you. And I knew you before time began. 
And I saved you before time began. And I gave you a holy calling before time began. Not before, not according to your works before time began. But according to my purpose and my grace, I did it for you before time began. Amen. But what about my weaknesses or shortcomings? Well, he knew about that before time began. He knew that. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He still did it. And if he was willing to do that, listen, read, read your Bible. This will, this will encourage you. Read, read Romans. If God was willing to do that, give Jesus like he did. Jesus was willing to give himself like he did. He goes on to say this. How shall he not freely give us all things? If he gave Jesus and gave the best, why would he withhold anything else? He will not withhold anything from you that he has provided through the salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you listening today? But then you, the question comes up, and I have to deal with this, is that, uh, and keep in mind, that God did all of this by grace. And he, of course, his plan was... In eternity past, he planned it, but it didn't manifest. The manifestation of it took place 2,000 years ago with Jesus. I said it's an early service, and I want to say it again. I don't ask God to heal me. I don't ask God for money. I don't ask him for a lot of things that Christians ask God for. I have not asked God to heal me in 30 years fact I have received my healing on many occasions supernaturally through the word of God how did it happen it wasn't because I asked him to heal me the reason why I didn't ask him to heal me is because he already healed me I didn't ask him for finances I don't ask God for money because he already gave it to me if you're going through a test and a trial and you get in faith, believe God, receive the grace of God that he's provided for you, and somebody comes along and say, I can see you're doing a lot better these days. When did you get healed? You can tell them, I got healed. It's been about 2,000 years now. Oh, by the way, I'll even take it back a little further. I've been healed since before time began. I've been healed since before time began. Amen. Oh, how, well, how'd you get that financial breakthrough? Oh, I got that financial breakthrough uh, before time began. How did you, did you ask God for it? No, I didn't ask God for it. He just gave it to me 2,000 years ago through Jesus. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You're only 35 years old. Oh, excuse me, I'm a lot older than that because he knew me before time began. Oh, you, know how, you don't have no idea how old I am, really. Seriously. I'm actually really pretty old. Hello, my body doesn't show it. Well, I don't know. Well, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, well, not really. That's how long I've been whole. When did you get healed? When did you get free? Oh, before time. Well, so you can identify with what I'm saying. You, probably, you don't understand the time began thing, before time began thing. So let me bring you up to, up to I'll bring you you know, fast forward to 2,000 years ago. Let me fast forward to 2,000 years ago. I've been healed for 2,000 years. I've been provided for financially for 2,000 years. Why? Why? Because the Bible says remembering the what? Remembering the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. I don't ask him. He's already given it to me by grace. I receive it from him. This is what faith does. Faith receives what grace has already provided in eternity past through Jesus it receives it, accepts it. You don't ask God to heal you. You accept the healing. Somebody said to me one day, and God bless them for it because they were coming along in their faith, and I'd been doing some teaching on faith and healing and things like that. But they came up to me and said, Pastor Dave, I'm really starting to get this now, and I just want you to know, I just know God's going to heal me now. I just know he's going to heal me. And I said to this person, I said, Sister, let me just make a little adjustment here. 
I want you to do something here. Just, you need to take out the word gonna, G-O-N-N-A. Take the, I want you to take, remove the gonna out of that statement and say this, I know God healed me. I know God healed me. Because the statement, I know God's gonna, means that he hasn't. Which is a complete contradiction of what we just read. Now, they didn't realize that. You know, they were coming along in their faith, and I compliment them in, in moving forward in their faith at that time. Now, I, they know, they understand this today, of course. But it was a gr- I was really glad to hear that because it illustrates really the mindset of many in the body of Christ today that someday God's going to do some of these things. I know God's going to provide for me. No, he has not going to. Don't it? He's never going to do it again. He already did it. I want you to know that God hasn't done that for over 2,000 years now. Did you know that? God hasn't healed anybody for 2,000 years. Oh, what? God hasn't, God hasn't provided for him in 2,000 years. No, he hasn't done it since 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he did it once and for all, forever, and it still stands. Do you understand? He's not going about doing it now. He already did it. What we're doing is we're accepting and receiving what he has already done, and it has stood for all these years before time began. Yes! Come on now! Before time began. Woo! Come on now. Yeah, but what about the sovereignty of God? I'm looking at my watch. Nice watch, huh? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Does that make you feel better? Does that make you feel better? I got that watch up there. I have no idea what time it is. Listen to me. Come on now. Sovereignty. Oh, but God is sovereign. He can do whatever He wants to do. Really? We don't have any control over anything. He can do what He wants, when He wants, how He wants to do it, where He wants to do it. God's sovereign. Okay. I'll accept that. He is. You're right. And guess what? Before time began, in His sovereignty... In his sovereignty, he decided, I'm going to pour out my grace on you. I'm going to make you a partner with me. I'm going to be in you and you're going to be in me. In his sovereignty, he said, I will give you all the power and all the authority that I have. Jesus rose from the dead, took the keys of death and hell away from the enemy of God. And then he said, I, all authority and all power has been given unto me. Now you go therefore. So in my sovereignty, I'm going to speak now for God. In my sovereignty, I choose to give you all that authority and all that power. Now I give it to you. In my sovereignty, I do. Yes, he is sovereign. He is sovereign and he has given you a lot more control in this world than you think you have. But if you take the teaching, the false teaching of sovereignty that people preach today, that you don't have any control and you have no say so, and whatever happens, happens, good or bad, God's in it no matter what. That's, that teaching will kill you. It will take your life before the time. And then you have people that stand up in the pulpit and say, we don't understand why this person has died so young. We don't, have to, we don't understand. But all I can say is this, that God needed him in heaven more than he was needed here on the earth. I just rebuke that lie. That's a lie. God did not Listen, I'm going to tell you something. A 12-year-old has better sense than that. A 12-year-old, unless he gets somebody gets a hold of him, would say, God is not a daddy killer. God didn't kill my dad. 
Do you know that some of the worst dictators that have ever existed throughout human history became killers of humanity, killers of Christians, killers of those who had any faith in God because they were told that God kills people for a higher purpose and a, a, a higher reason. And they stood there and they listened to that and left and cursed God. Said, I'll do everything I can to stop people from spreading anything about God. Did you know that? There are dictators, historically speaking, that had been, one was in a theological seminary. I believe it was Joseph Stalin, if I'm not mistaken. He was going to seminary. And he heard this doctrine on sovereignty and God is the cause of all the evil and the pain and the suffering for his higher purposes and higher reasons and he decided I don't want him he's a bad God he's an evil God and that's why they wanted to stamp out Christianity from their country do you understand what's going on here that kind of teaching creates God haters Hello, stay with me. All right. So why would God need my dad in heaven? God doesn't kill dads. God, let me say this, I'll conclude. God is being misrepresented. Would you agree with that today? The Bible says it's the devil that goes about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible tells us that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Ghost and power who went about doing what? Good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil. Good God, heal what bad devil done. You get it? So God is being misrepresented. If he's guilty of all these things and we blame him for these things, there isn't a civilized nation on the face of the earth that wouldn't convict him of crimes against humanity. Y'all quiet on me now. I think that the idea that God either causes or allows evil so that we will somehow grow spiritually is the worst heresy that has hit the body of Christ. Amen. If you really believe that God controls everything, what's the use of doing anything? After all, it's all up to God, right? Amen. If you believe that God is trying to teach you something through sickness or poverty, then why are you seeing a doctor and why are you looking for a job? Why don't you refrain from both and learn a lesson? Come on now. Come on. Amen. It's the truth, isn't it? Why not suffer as much as you can and really learn a lesson? Amen. How dumb can you be? Come on now, how dumb can you be and still breathe? It doesn't get any dumber than that. Stay with me now. Come on. Listen, listen. The Bible says that in the last days, according to Isaiah 5 and verse 20, look at The Bible says in the last days that people will call evil good and good evil. Denominations today are teaching that when you get sick or experience financial problems, God is causing it so that he can teach you something to humble you. That is an example of calling evil good. Isn't it? That is an example. Any denomination that says to you that God is the one who's willed your sickness He's one that has willed your financial demise so that he can teach you a lesson to draw you closer to him. That same person is calling evil good. And the Bible says in the last days, there would you, who would have thought that that would be manifesting in the church, in the body of Christ? I'm still closing. I know that you heard me say in closing, and I'm still doing the first close. God is not, I gotta, I, I'm going to conclude my conclusion. Can I conclude my conclusion today? God, God is not responsible for killing babies. 
He's not responsible for rape, violence, poverty, sickness. Satan is the author of all of these things. And don't watch the person that on television that has, I don't care how great their preaching is, how great and big their ministry is, but when someone stands, and there, is, there are folks out there that do these things, but one person I was watching, I go, wow, this is great, and I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater or anything like that, but, but, when they say, you know, you know my story and my testimony, how I was raped brutally and repeatedly. And I'm going to be bold and tell you something. I know a lot of people have a hard time with it, but it was part of God's overall divine plan for my life. Because look at me now today. I'm preaching all over the world and people are being saved and coming into the kingdom of God and I've been able to reach people. Had I not gone through that, I wouldn't be here today doing what I'm doing today. So therefore, God divinely, for His higher purpose, planned that I should be rep repeatedly molested and raped for His higher good. I heard that. That kind of preaching is what creates atheist dictators. That's right. That's right. That preaching. More people have died, died, and been murdered at the hands of folks that were exposed to that doctrine. And it caused them to hate God. Come on now, are we stirred up? Well, I think I am anyway. So, <laughs> God is not responsible for these things. The Bible clearly states that we are to resist the enemy. Resist means to actively fight against something. If we aren't fighting against sickness, then we're submitting to it. Well, Jesus already fought the fight, but you understand it's called the fight of faith that we fight. You know, you stay in faith. Amen, and believe God for it. So, uh, you know, we need to understand the Bible says, do not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And, um, but it all gets back down to this reality. Understand, when we, we talk about the sovereignty of God, and the reason why I got into all of that is because there is a mentality among believers that everything that we have is, uh, whatever it is, it's an automatic thing. If God wants to bless me, He will bless me. If He wants to provide for me, He'll provide for me. If He wants to heal me, He'll just heal me. No, no, no. First of all, He's already provided for you. He's already healed you. He's already blessed you. He's already done it 2,000 years ago. He's not going to do it again. It's already done. It's a settled fact. It is now up to you to receive it by faith. Amen? And I wanted to get over into that sovereignty part because there is some folks that think that. I had a person here, was a pastor that was here and we had a pastor's meeting. I'm, I'm talking about a pastor, a local pastor. And he come in and Pastor Joey, I think Joey was there when he had he's going, he's going, oh, are you ready? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but just a little bit. And he was going, oh, I, I, do, I just don't understand it. I don't, I pray I asked God why he's doing this to me. I said, excuse me, what church do you pastor? I want to call all your members and say, get out of there because you're going to die if you stay under that teaching. Why is God doing this to me? And then there's another guy, he's a famous celebrity, and people go there because he's a celebrity, and he had cancer and lost his arm and his shoulder, and he stands up before thousands of people, and he says, I have to tell you that cancer is a gift from God. Cancer is my friend. If I hadn't have had this, then I wouldn't be being used by God today doing what I am doing. Cancer is not your friend. It is the enemy. It's some, the devil himself. Are you listening? And that's that teaching that's out there, folks. I'm telling you. It's sad, isn't it? No, God has provided all good things for you. Amen. All things freely to enjoy. I use this illustration. Um, the balance of grace and faith. I'll conclude my conclusion. Uh, the balance of, of grace and faith is, is, is like sodium and chloride. Taken individually, both are poisons and can kill you. 
But when mixed together, they become salt, which is something you must have in your body to live. Are you listening? So grace without your positive response of faith won't save you. Faith that isn't a response to God's grace will bring you into condemnation. So do what? Put your faith in what God has already done for you by grace, and you'll have victory that overcomes the world. You receive that today? Amen. We're going to close our broadcast today by talking to you about where you will spend eternity. You know, the Bible clearly indicates that there is a heaven to gain and, and a hell to miss. You know, God is a good God. And some people say, if God is such a good God, why would he send people to hell? Well, I want you to know that God is not sending people to hell. In fact, he's trying to keep people from going to that dreadful place. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus Christ came to this earth. To, he came to take upon himself the penalty of every man's sin, past, present, and future. And he made a way for us to make heaven our home. And I want to extend that invitation to you today to secure heaven as your home. The Bible says that there is a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And those whose names were found in the book of life entered into heaven. And so, have you made your reservation yet? Do you have your name on the list? Well, you can't do anything in this world to earn it. It's a free gift of salvation. It's a free gift of eternal life. Jesus came and he paid the ultimate price so that you could be cleansed from your sin and so that you would never suffer the penalty of sin in this world or in the world to come. And so I invite you today to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What happens when you pray this prayer? We call it the sinner's prayer. You end up becoming born again in your spirit. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the, to the Father except through Him. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. And I want to challenge you today to make this decision. Say yes to Jesus Christ and be born again. Have heaven as your home and also have a wonderful relationship with God in this life. Jesus came here to give you peace and to give you joy and to bring you back into relationship with God the Father. And so I invite you right now, pray this prayer. We call it the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation, and you will have eternal life. Say this, dear God in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I confess I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. I believe with my heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart now and make me a brand new person on the inside. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I believe you got born again. We'd love to know about it. Would you please write us or call us? Let us know what God has done in your life. We appreciate you joining our broadcast today, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next week. God bless you. And beside the river. Thank you for watching Demonstrations of Faith, a ministry outreach of Faith Alive Christian Center in Reno, Nevada. If you don't have a home church, we invite you to come and connect with us. We have ministry for the entire family on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Our Connect Youth Ministry meets on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Child care is available for all services. Our location is 120 Hubbard Way, half block east of the Pepper Mill in Reno. You can find us online at faithalive.net or by searching for Faith Alive at all social media outlets. Thanks for watching and join us next week for Demonstrations of Faith. And it's flowing too.